let's welcome in our guest, Hall of Famer, two-time MVP, and and Brooklyn Nets coach, which is so odd to say, uh, Steve Nash. Steve, thanks for joining us. Uh, congrats. I, I just have to say, I'm, I, I know I texted you a couple times, but I'm, I'm so excited for you. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to, great to be here. Great to join you guys. Um, yeah, life took a, life took a, a twist, but, uh, I'm, I'm excited. Obviously I, I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have gone into this without a lot of thought and, and, and preparation. So, uh, yeah, it's exciting for me and my family. I know you've done a ton of press and a ton of media since this was announced, but in, in sort of getting to know you over the last, uh, six or seven years, um, and knowing how you are as, as a dad and knowing what your thought process was about retirement. Um, can you just kind of walk us through the process of, of sort of getting to the point where you were ready to accept, accept this job? Yeah. I, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I think some of it is kind of like out there in the ether, but, uh, I think if we, t if we think about like how it came to be, it probably started with, um, working with the Warriors and being up there, you know, once a month and being around um, Steve Kerr and, and his staff and players and the environment he created. And, you know, for me, I, you know, I think it started to plant a seed that this would be a lot of fun, but I also recognized that my family life was at a stage where I wanted to protect that opportunity to stay home and, and be a, you know, a dad who wakes his kids up, makes them breakfast, takes them to school, picks them up after school and, and is hands on around the clock and, and have those hours when they're at school to, to do whatever other projects or interests I have. So that was the life that I, you know, had designed for myself for the kind of six years or so since I retired. And, you know, I think it just started to realize, like, you, you know, you can only sit on the sidelines for so long. Um, you get that itch to to compete and to be a teammate and to build. And you know, I think for me, I started to just kind of let that sink in that, like, this is something that I would really enjoy. Um, this is something that, you know, suits me. I mean, you know, without saying that I'm going to be a great coach or anything, like, I, I love to teach. Uh, I love to lead. I love to, to collaborate and be a teammate. And I love to compete. And, you know, where else are you going to be able to do all those things? So, you know, sharing with the younger generation, your experiences and to be able to help them reach their goals and to be able to bring a group together. Those are things that really excite me. Steve, when did, with, with this particular, with this particular gig, when did it sort of become real for you? When, when did you sort of like wrap your head around the fact that this is actually happening and 2020 has taken yet another crazy turn? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that actually happening is pretty recent. You know, I, I threw my name in the hat in the summer, you know, with Sean. I mean, Sean Marks and I have been friends for 20 years, played against each other internationally, played with each other on the Suns, played against each other and just been friends, family friends. Um, so we've always had a conversation. He's always come to me with with ideas and opportunities that I wasn't really prepared for. Um, and this time I came to him. And obviously part of that is, I found a lot of excitement in this opportunity. You know, it's a unique opportunity. Um, one, obviously, the the, the roster is, uh, you know, uh, an incredible roster to to walk in as a rookie coach. You're very fortunate. Um, the organization, the work Sean's done to build a culture and to build the performance team and analytics department and all the things that he's already put in place is fantastic. I know I'll get a lot of support and we'll have a, you know, a talented team. So. That was exciting for me to be able to compete and to, to have a team that has an opportunity to, to, to contend. Um, and then that was a big difference maker. You know, I don't know, and this is probably going to sound, um, you know, unfair in a sense, but if it was a development situation, I don't think that would have got me, you know, to leave the life that I had. Um, this was unique. And then I think also for my family, you know, five kids, um, you know, it's a big move to Brooklyn from, from California. You know, we live four, to, four doors down from the beach. My daughters are 16 in a month. That's a big move for them, all their friends. But I thought it was something that would be really impactful for my family, for my kids to see a different way of living, different culture. You know, they're familiar with the city, but to actually live there, uh, the diversity, the history, I think that's really important for my family as well. Steve, I would assume this is probably not the first time that you've you've potentially talked to a team about either a front office role or a coaching position. Um, and, you know, I, I, I had you on my podcast. I think you were my second guest in 2016. 
and to- Tommy, Tommy, my very first, somebody had just, I can't remember who had just gotten fired from the Suns. It was the coach from the Suns had just gotten fired. And my very first question to Steve was, are you going to take the job? And Woj had texted me before and was like, don't, don't ask Steve this question right away. Wait a few questions in. And I just came out and swung. I just came out and swung. I like it. I like it. I mean, I was so not ready at that point to coach. Um, I, I have had uh, um, opportunities uh, or let's say offers and overtures from, from, from a bunch of situations, but I wasn't ready. And, and, you know, I feel now I'm ready and, and even, you know, having, you know, been in this position now for a few weeks, I feel, you know, just like I, I there's going to be times to be hard, as you know, it's an, it's a, it's a, it's almost an impossible job. It's a hard job. It's something that it's, it, you can succeed and it can still be, it's imperfect and impossible, but you try to do the best and win. And, um, but I, right now I feel like I made the right decision. I feel comfortable. I feel excited. I feel motivated every day to grow and learn, catch up, you know, on all the issues that I, you know, need to, to learn and, and grow into. But, uh, it isn't, it is a, it isn't a, a, you know, as you know, around the clock endeavor, you know, you, you there's never, never enough connecting that needs to be done, uh, let alone the technical aspects. Yeah. There, there's a great article this, this past week on ESPN, Kevin Artovitz does a, an annual article about, um, up and coming coaches and, and potential job openings and, and who would be good in those fits. And the f- whole first part of the article was talking about just the role that the coach plays now in today's NBA and the amount of people he has to manage, the amount of people, honestly, that he has to answer to with all the advances in sports scientists, with all these new owners. Uh, so it's a very it's a very complicated thing. I want to read a, a Spencer Dinwiddie quote. Uh, this is something he said uh, after you you got hired. He said, quote, coaching at this level, especially with the talent that we have, it's like 80% psychologist, 10% temperament, 10% X's and O's. It's mostly about managing the egos. So how do you feel about that breakdown of his? And also just how are you sort of uh, framing your, your mindset about how you're going to coach this team? I mean, I think he's, he's, you know, he's right. You know, who knows what those numbers and breakdowns are, but the job is about connectivity, creating uh, relationships of, uh, you know, whatever the personalities in that room add up to and how the puzzle fits and, you know, gaining that trust, especially I think in this generation, you know, when I came in the league, it was a lot more like an authoritarian position being a coach and this is how we're doing it. And that those days are long gone, you know, um, you know, the world has changed and, and guys play in the league now. It's a different generation who've had different experiences in upbringing. So I think it's really important to, you know, really double down on those relationships and build that culture. Culture is a system of behavior. So setting the standard for how we're going to behave, what's important to us, you know, who are who are we, what are our values, all those kind of, you know, ad speaky uh, self-help uh, books, you know, but they, they, there's truth to it. You have to know who you are. You have to know what you're going to do. So I think for me, I wasn't hired to come in and, and, you know, uh, be a tactical wizard. You know, I think they understand that my acumen for the game is, is strong and that I can catch up on any of the technical, technical aspects. But I think they hire me because I have the experience and the personality to, to work with these guys and to, to be able to help them grow, reach their potential and bring it all together. So I have to, I can't lose sight of that. You know, I can't come in and start being Mr. X's and O's and lose sight of the fact that, yeah, of course I want to be strong in all departments, but I, I, I have to lead with my understanding and, and of, of group dynamics, leading, going through the experience that these guys are going through. I've, I've been there. Um, and that I think is key, especially when you have a team with a roster that we have that has a lot of moving parts, you know, guys coming off injury, guys who haven't played together, um, guys that are still developing. So I, I think I got to lead with why I was brought here and what they saw in me and, and catch up in the other departments. So, so what are the, what, one of the biggest challenges I think for the modern NBA coach, you use the word authoritarian. And for me, I, I think the biggest challenge is um, establishing accountability without being that, without being the authoritarian, because um, it's a different generation of players. It's a different generation of, of culture that we've been brought up in. Um, but I still think there's so much value in accountability 
and 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 that to me is the hard, is the hardest part. And I've seen it time and time again in my career, uh, where that has has sort of altered te- team chemistry because you know somebody's being held to a different standard than someone else. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, you look. There's levels to this, right? Like you, you're, you're not going to treat every player the same. But there has to be a standard and understanding, a system of beliefs and behaviors. And so getting us to have that standard has to be a common and clear and simple message. Like this is how we operate. And, um, you know, I look at it in some ways. I think as a coach, you know, the, one of the greatest strengths of a coach is honesty. You know, and so I, I look at it as being cold and analytical with the basketball information and being, you know, warm, supportive and a family member with the person. You know, so that's the way I kind of approach it is cold and analytical. It's nothing personal. This is what I see. This is what what the numbers say. This is what the film says. Um, you know, as far as the game goes, that doesn't mean that you can't get here, there, or wherever you want to go, and we'll support you getting there. So we, we're cold and analytical with the information, but we're warm and supporting, you know, the person. So I think that's really important. I think that that ability to, to not shirk the responsibility of being honest, clear, simple, honest, you know, that's so, as you know, you've seen it, you just alluded to it. When that doesn't happen, you know, fissures and, and gaps and cancers and whatever you want to call it, form in a group. And, and you got to avoid that because that can be the downfall of the best teams. We, we talked to Kevin about this a little bit last week, but do you think, you know, your sort of apprenticeship in the Bay sort of helped you understand this dynamic a little bit because as you mentioned before you know the league has changed a lot when it comes to this kind of thing even in 10 years and they're they're a perfect example of you know that team is more talent maybe than any team ever and and what steve has to do there in terms of managing those personalities is a very unique situation and you sort of got to see it firsthand yeah but it was it was an incredible experience for me i mean to see them winning you know winning culture and environment and what steve you know where you know a big part of being a coach today is especially you know all of us coaches today came up in a different generation a big part of being a good coach is knowing what to let go of you know like let's not hold on to things that you know our coaches held on to let's focus in on what's really important let's protect that and so to see the way steve was able to manage that manage the you know the gap in generations between him and his players to manage the you know the different personalities the different needs skill sets uh you know he was he's brilliant at that and and i I was grateful that i got the opportunity And, and frankly that was part of the seed to me you know getting here at this moment in time I, I saw your your interview on TNT the other night, um, and I don't I think it was Ernie, but th- they asked you about just your coaching style and how much of an influence the coaches that that you played for, whether that, that, that whether that was Don Nelson or Dan Tony, are going to influence how you coach. And and the, the the remarkable thing that you said was, you know, there's going to be an influence, of course, but um, you recognize that the game is always evolving. And I think that's that's such a good starting point. Kevin, again, not to not to bring up the pod with Kevin again, but the thing that struck me so much about Kevin was that he recognized that the game is evolving, so he's always got to learn something new. And it's it's that mindset I think that that really separates great players, and of course, it's going to separate uh, great coaches as well. It, I, you're right. I mean, you have to be open. And you have to know what you don't know. And, you know, I think it's really important to to recognize that things are evolving. Things are changing, uh, especially with technology, science. Like, things are changing quicker than they ever were before. So you have to be adaptable and mobile. You have to be willing to be open to change, to looking at things differently. You know, you don't want to be confusing. Uh, you don't want to lose sight of the goal uh, in order to, to be just to, just for the purpose of being adaptable but having that mindset as you said is so important like especially as a rookie coach like I can't come in saying well this is how we did it you know th- this uh, you know this is exactly how we're going to do it you know that's that's not the way you know like you have to come in and really and I'm lucky because we have three four months before camp you know 
minimum. So to be able to build that with my staff, to be able to dig in deep with our analytics department, our performance team, and figure out what's our best methodology, but also style of play. What are we trying to accomplish at both ends of the floor? Like all those things, I have time. I can collaborate with my staff. I come in like almost hat in hand, like how, how what, you know, what is happening out there on the floor these days? Like, of course, you know, I'm watching and I understand, but I'm saying that at a high level, it's like really open. Like, what are we looking at here? Like you can see in this playoffs, I mean, it feels to me like whoever contains the ball every night wins. I mean, it's just so, it's, it's all positionless wing players who can put the ball on the floor, break down a defense and create plays. Now that's a very simplistic view, but what I'm saying is like that wasn't necessarily the case in yesteryear, you know, like it, it's quickly evolved to this. And so where's that going? You know, where's the, you know, the 30 foot three going? Is that, is that becoming like a, a high value proposition for certain people? Or is that always going to be an outlier? Like, so there's all these things where the game is stretching into new areas. And I think being adaptable to that is important. I'm trying to imagine an NBA coach uh, walking into a locker room on the first day of training camp and saying, this is how we're going to play. This is what we're going to do. And, and never be willing to adjust off of that because they're, they're really good coaches. I mean, I've, you, you've probably been on these teams too, where, you know, first day of camp, this is how we're going to play. You play that way in training camp. And then all of a sudden you get three preseason games in the regular season game hasn't even started yet. And three preseason in, you're like, you know what? We're changing our pick and roll coverage. We're getting torched on this. Hundred percent. I mean, that's the thing. Like, right now, everything I'm doing is theoretical, right? Like, I have oh, they're great ideas. You know, they're great <laughs> analysis, but it's theoretical until you actually put your players and their personalities and their skill sets and their connectivity on the floor and and work at it. You don't know, and so um, you know we know a lot but we don't know at all. And that bit that you don't know that you need to decipher, that is the job along with the players, their personalities, you know, how you interact with them. So, you know, the other thing is that I think more than ever, it's important to collaborate with your players on how we're playing at both ends, you know, you know, you, you, like what, what is there to gain if you, if you've devised the best pick and roll coverage and it's actually highly successful, but your players are uncomfortable. Like those percentage points you gain in efficiency, you might lose in will or connectivity or environment. So, you know, it's, it's always, I think, a constant evaluation and balancing of, of, of what your goal is and what's the long-term effects of what you're doing in your methodology. When did you first get to know Kyrie? I guess playing against him his rookie year. Um, you know, when I retired, I spent a couple of days working out with him in New York, kind of training him, you know, for just sharing stuff with him. You know, that must have been five, six, six years ago now. Um, so we've always had a relationship since his rookie year, um, you know, but it, it's something that I'm excited to develop. You know, I obviously have a much more developed and, and a much longer history with Kevin. Uh, but with Kai, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, this is one of my favorite players. I mean, he's he's a he's kind of a savant with the basketball. So, um, you know, but also like to get to know him off the court. I mean, this is a guy that donated one and a half million dollars to the WNBA girls who were affected by the COVID work stop. You know, those girls that were unable to go because of COVID. Um, he provided like, I don't know, almost a million dollars in meals to people in different, you know, scenarios for COVID. He's, he's helped so many people and, 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 and his fight and belief in the social justice causes. I mean, this is a deep, sensitive, uh, intelligent person that I, I'm excited to, to get to know and, and see what makes him tick on a deeper level. Have, have you thought at all about um, just that combination, Kyrie and Kevin, and how you can sort of use them together in, in, in two man games specifically? Sure. I mean, it, that that's probably the easiest part of the job. Throw Kevin and Kai in a two man game. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's, that's just is what it is. They're two exceptionally difficult players to defend. Um, you know, obviously Kai can score on them, you know, as well as anyone in an ISO and Kevin with his length is a matchup problem for everyone. So, you know, those two in, in two man games is incredible, but also the versatility, you know, Kai's excellent off the ball. 
Um, as, as brilliant as he is with the ball in his hand, he's excellent off the ball. Kevin can play all five positions, and I plan to, to use him in all five positions. Um, so that and – then, and then I get excited about, you know, some of the other guys, Karras and Spencer and Jared Allen and DJ. And you go down the line, Joe Harris. I mean – You're excited about DJ? You love, love him. <laughs> Oh, DJ. Uh, I, get, DJ I, have a, I have a hard time getting excited about DJ. DJ only gets slander <laughs> on this show. We don't say anything nice about him on, on this show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's my guy. That's my guy. I was with him yesterday. He said you're his guy. So. Yeah, no, I love DJ. Um, yeah, before before we move on, um, uh, uh, you know, from the, from the net stuff, you know, I, I do want to ask you about sort some of the some of the reaction and some of the backlash when it was announced. And you know, I, I think you've answered it really well in the past. You know, but were, were you su- sort of surprised at all by that reaction, by that sort of visceral thing of of just like, oh, whoa, 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 this is this is white privilege that that Steve was hired for this job. Uh, to be honest, I was prepared for it and expected it. Um, we we're in such a you know, pivotal time for social change and, and racial injustice um, that I expected it. it's inflammatory right now. And it should be, it should be a conversation starter. You know, I don't think contextually this is white privilege in that there's a precedence there. Lots of uh, African-American players retiring and going straight to head coaching jobs. Um, you know, I, I think I had a unique career that puts me in a position with some of those guys that allows you to, to kind of skip the line as some people said, um, but I think it's important that we talk about these things. I, I, I have benefited from white privilege my entire life in other ways. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I don't avoid it. I don't necessarily think this is the, you know, an example where I go, yeah, you're, you know what, you're right. I should, I should not do this. Um, but I, I think it's important to talk. I think I'm, you know, I'm, hopefully a great ally for, for, for the movement. And, and hopefully, you know, the owners of the Nets, Joe and Clara Sai have been unbelievable in their commitment to making change. I think they've, they've pledged $50 million over the next five or 10 years to, and, and also with a lens to create a, a organizational change and refinement in that issue, but also in the community. So I feel like I'm in a great place to be a part of, of change, part of the conversation to, you know, to help elevate, you know, people of color and minorities uh, to get opportunities that they deserve. So um, I expected it. I think it's great that we're talking about it. Um, and uh, and hopefully I can be a, 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 a part of the change going forward. Yeah, I think in, in these scenarios, like context really matters. And you mentioned, you know, precedence to this. And you know, I got a I got a list of guys like Steve Kerr, Doc Rivers, Isaiah Thomas, Jason Kidd, Derek Fisher, Larry Bird, like all those guys. They they didn't pay their dues coaching. You know, they were all former players. And guess what? Some of them are white and some of them are black. And you know, there there absolutely exists. White privilege absolutely exists. But I think in the NBA, there's a thing called player privilege. <laughs> and and to your point, like Sometimes players skip the line. Like if Chauncey Billups right now, if Chauncey Billups wants to get a G, a head, be the head GM with no experience, or a head coach with no experience, he could do that in a second. He's, I know he's had offers to do it already. He could do it in a second. So there's, there's a difference in the in this scenario, and and also to to a degree, and and you know this too, like. The NBA is such an insulated world. We we live in it. We live sort of in a different world where, if if you're talented, if you're talented, then you rise, and it doesn't necessarily matter the 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 tone of your skin. Yeah, it is a club, you know, in a way. Like once you're in, you know, there's a privileged and different lens into which we get to live our lives, and I think it's important just to be aware of that and to yeah. not, you know except that as like you're protected for life even outside of the NBA bubble. Um, so, uh, but I, I think you're right. I mean, it's kind of, I, you know, it, it, part of it's entertainment. Like I hate to say it because it is a really, really important issue. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, when that, like I, Stephen A called me and was like, you know, I didn't mean you, and, you know, he kind of did put my name with it on <laughs> But he said he didn't mean you, and I know he walked it back. But part of it, that's his job, is to elicit response. And, you know, it, it, it's also, you know, a part of 
the way he's he's talked about these positions for a long time. The way he worded and presented it maybe put me out there as like the scapegoat in a sense. But you know, you have, you know what it's like. You know the media and the different levels of reporting. And look, I, I'm I'm all in on social justice and reform and change and all the things that we can do. Like it, I mean, like from the bottom of my heart, that hurts me that our society is not equal. Um, so that is positive. We're talking about it. We're debating it. Um, you know, th- this is something that our, our organization is taking very, very seriously. Th- that's it. I don't, you know, I'm on with my job and I'm on with the, with that to support the cause. And, and I think that white people have a very pivotal role to play in this because black people have been fighting this for 400 years. And what's, what's, what's not been there for them the whole time? White people. So like, you know, like, I don't want to put it on like, give us the hero complex to change this thing. But like, the reality is we need to make change. We need to look at ourselves. We don't have to pay for the sins of our forefathers, but we can be the change that we see going forward as we evolve as a society. Yeah, th- there is a there is a fine line there. Um, I, I think we've all seen, you know, people on either side of this, but there's a fine line between having some sort of white savior complex and and just wanting be willing to listen and be willing to engage in the conversation and be willing to help and and not look for any personal credit to this and and and, and look I'm not I'm not going to sit here I don't think there's I, I need to sit here and defend you or defend Sean but I know you both really well and I've known I've gotten to know Sean a ton over the last four or five years and you got this is who you guys have been for your entire career. You go back to late '90s, early 2000s. Like you were speaking out on things. You've been doing this for 20 plus years. Sean has been the same way. So this, to 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 me, like I understand the the uh, the the backlash to a degree. I think it's important that in some ways it was pointed out. I, I do, but I don't think that I don't think it's a real thing here. I think it's maybe part of the conversation, but it's not like a real thing when we when we talk about your hire, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, but we can't take our foot off the gas as allies and supporters of the movement. So that's that's my takeaway. We're talking about it, um, debate. Hopefully, more and more people become open to the, the to the need and role that we can all play in this. And uh, and that's kind of where where I I leave it. Um, you guys are in a position where next season you'll be considered, you know, one of one of the favorites in the East, and uh, you know, and obviously depending on how the rest of the the off season plays out with with a bunch of teams. Um, Rich Kleiman, when he came on the podcast with Kevin, he he asked me a question. He said he said, "Does it bother you that you haven't won a championship?" And, and my response was, yeah, I think about it every day. And if I'm, you know, 65, I'm still going to be thinking about it. And you came close, you played on some great teams. You had a hall of fame career. Um, does, does it bother you? Do you think about it that you didn't, you didn't win a championship as a player? Uh, yes. Um, it's just always there. Do you know what I mean? There's a hole there. Like, and I don't mean like, it, it, it's not there's not it's not like um if someone says you didn't win a championship that bothers me what bothers me is my internal dialogue you know like there's a hole there that's like ah you know what i mean it's just like um you know and i and i and granted like not everyone can win and and, and had great opportunities got close didn't didn't get it done but um, you know, as a competitor and as someone that your career comes and goes, an 18 year career comes and goes like that. And so that's not coming back. So there, there definitely is a, a, you know, a hole inside my psyche where it's like, you know, you, it never goes away. Yeah. J- JJ and I have talked a lot about, uh, on the show and off the show about the, the Kawhi shot last year. And how he just he just thinks about it all the time, you know. And it's one of those things that there's nothing in the moment he could have done. There's nothing now you can do about it, but it's still in the back of your mind. Do you have specific moments like that that are just kind of gnawing at you? 
I mean, there's, you know, like, I, not th- like that's a great example of, right, like that ball bounced on the rim, what, four times? And yeah. it kind of changed the course of NBA history in a number of ways. And so, um, and that's those, that's, like, that's the thing that I don't think people, we're such a, like, win is winning is everything society and one team can win every year and it takes luck to win, you know, like, um, you know, Kawhi's shot bouncing around the rim changed everything in the luck for Toronto. Uh, Kevin and clay getting hurt in the finals, you know, that's a bounce for Toronto. That doesn't mean I don't have the, the maximum respect for Nick nurse. What an incredible coach he is. What a tough, smart, you know, versatile team they have. But those are factors that, you know, that, that ball, I mean, a millimeter, that could have been a brick, you know, but that millimeter, it kept it alive and it bounced around and goes in, you know, and then, you know, injuries in the final. And you could say the same, the year, the first year Golden State won, you know, they, they, every round, I think the other, the opponent was missing a big player. So there's a, there's an element, of course, of luck most of the time that, that, you know, is the difference between, you know, someone winning and losing. It, it's kind of like, like Houston almost beating Golden State um, those two years. Those, I think it was both game sevens. That's almost as big an accomplishment or better than Golden State winning. Like before those seasons, it was like, there's no way anyone's going to beat Golden State. And they were within, you know, minutes, shots, plays of beating them. So we lose sight sometimes, I think, of the context and that not everyone can win and that some things have to fall into place to win that that the winning team didn't necessarily count on or do anything extra to create. So I don't know, we're going down a rabbit hole, but, uh, you know, that's the deal. That's how we respond. That's how our society accepts this challenge. It's like win or nothing. And there's no, we don't want to even talk about the gray area, right? It's like, like we just forget about all the bumps in the road or the bounces that go their way. And, 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 and that's the deal. So let's accept the deal and let's get on with it. And so I, I look back and instead of saying like, I didn't have any luck, I look back and say, I didn't make enough plays. Or we didn't make enough plays. We didn't have any luck. You know, so I look inward at, 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 at our and my failures. I look more at myself for our team failures. But there is a, it, it is truth. I mean, there is a reality that you have to have a little bit of luck. Before I follow up on that, I, I, I just want to say that Daryl Morey and Houston deserve a lot of credit. Agreed. Because when Kevin signed with Golden State, there was a sense that a number of teams were sort of unwilling to to go for it. Yeah. And we'll just wait this out. And and to his credit and to the and to the Rockets credit, they swung for the fences. They're up 3-2, you know, the first year and and Chris gets hurt at the end of game 5. You know, he hurts his hamstring, can't play in game 6 and game 7. Um they're up I think they were up 2-0 last year, right? In in the second round. So, you know, I don't know what the future there is. I don't know who Daryl's going to end up hiring as a coach, but you know, for for them to just go for it, and I I sometimes wonder like what would have happened if eh, five other teams had went for it. You know, would the Warriors have won those two? I don't know. You know, sure. um, it is a great point. Yeah, yeah and I but I, to follow up, I, are there specific series? Because because when I when I talk to Rich about this, like I can think of like four or five series or like four or five specific games in my career where I'm like, shit, if I had done this different or if this this play had gone different, you know, maybe I have a championship. Are there specific plays or series or games that you think about? Well, let me preface it by saying, like, I just gave you the rant about luck, but I also like look inward like the my failings were my failings and and I take that responsibility, but the teams that win it every year, they, they generally, they, they deserve to win. Yes. They had luck. That doesn't mean they didn't deserve it. You know, like I'm not saying like, Oh, those lucky bastards, they got a chip. No, I mean, you, ha- I'm, I'm just saying that there's a bounce along the way usually for a team to survive that battle of attrition and all those things that go into it, but they generally deserve it. Like that's not, that's, that's not what I'm saying. You know, but you definitely look back in, in, at series, you know, my first year in Phoenix, um, you know, Joe Johnson, like, broke his face and, like, orbital bone, I think it was. And, you know, he at the time, he was a little underrated. People didn't realize he was going to be, like, an eight-plus-time all-star or whatever, and he was great for us. 
you know, both sides of the ball, and we lost him. And he came back on the the last game of the conference finals against the Spurs, had like 20-something, big game, and we lost and got knocked out. But we didn't have him, you know, through the whole thing. So that like that like that's one example. You know, the second year, you know, you can always pin to like games. There was the, the Robert Ory hip check and the suspensions and all that stuff. So you, you, those are the obvious ones. But, you know, like I don't – I, I still look back at it like I did I I take responsibility. I didn't make enough plays. And and that that's the way I live with it is is that I I you know, I just did not get it done. And that doesn't mean I didn't play well and have good games and, and show up in big moments, but needed one more play, you know. Maybe it was in the second quarter, maybe it was in game three, you know. So that's kind of the way I approach it. There's definitely moments like like I just mentioned where you, you think, man, things could have been so different. But that's why it means so much to win because not everyone can do it. And some like myself who got really close a bunch of times, a bunch of teams, you know, let's call it, you know, I hope this isn't unfair, but we were smashing every team in the East. By the team that came out of the East, we'd beat twice by 30 sometimes in a season. But, you know, if we don't get out of the West, you're not winning a championship. And so, you know, we, we I never made the finals, but our teams were in a great position if we got out of the West to, to win it. And, and we didn't get it done. And I take responsibility. And, and that's why it's so great to win. I have a question for both of you guys. This is off of the, the Nuggets uh, comeback win last night. When when you're in a and, and JJ, you you certainly can speak to this from personal experience. But Steve, I'm sort of curious your take as well. When you're in a position where you're up in a series three one, and all of a sudden the momentum switches, the pendulum switches, and it starts coming, and you sort of see this team coming, and it's almost like it's an avalanche hitting, or between what's happening on the court, but then what's happening with the pressure of the media and everything else around it. This. How do you get yourself out of that? Because it felt like to me as sort of a fan's perspective, looking at this thing, it's not that Denver was a more talented team. It's this, it's it's almost just like the Clippers hit a wall and you could see last night when they when Denver went up, it was like they're not coming back. Like this thing is done. And so how do you kind of wrap your how do you get yourself out of like that vortex? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think the 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 short answer is that a lot of the, the short answer is a lot of these series can can shift sometimes on matchups and situations, you know, where some team figures something out and it takes a long, either it's insurmountable or it takes a long time for the other team to cope with that change. But when you're in those holes and you're fighting out, I think simply toughness and connectivity. You know, I, I think simply like to have that will and that toughness and connectivity is what is the special sauce or the ingredient that allows teams to, to fight back in those situations or, or to stop, you know, that type of run. Number one, th- this is why it's so important to not allow that momentum to ever build. <laughs> and, and I learned firsthand uh, in 2015 with the Rockets coming back to beat us when we were up three, one in the, in the conference semifinals and my two years in Philly, you know, that was my messaging to our team. You know, we, we get up on Miami my first year in the first round. We get up on Brooklyn in my second year in the first round. And we're up 2-1 against Toronto. We should have won uh, game four at home. And so you're, you're, you're constantly, you know, messaging that. Like, you know, you have, to, you have to put a team away. Because I've been on the other side of that, too, where you can see, you can feel that that sea change happening, and you're like, "Oh, that team, they're fucked. They're fucked. We're going to win this series." Um, and to Steve's point, you know, they couldn't stop Jamal Murray in the first half, and then in the second half, they have no choice but to blitz, and Jokic picks him apart. And it's just like when you have that dynamic two man game, it, it makes it really, really difficult. And the Nuggets, the Nuggets figure that out. And I, I would also say, like, everybody's making a big deal today about Jokic and Murray, but, like, give some credit to the guys on the end, other end of the ball, like J- Jeremy Grant and Torrey Craig and Paul Millsap. Like, those guys, as much as Jokic and Murray did offensively, those were the guys that won them the series. I mean, they played outstanding defense. They played great D, and I think, like, 
you know, some of those guys stepped up. Millsap didn't have a great scoring series, I don't believe, and, like, made some big threes or shots and plays. Same with Jeremy Grant. You know, the guys you're not going to rely on. In the big moment, they stepped up and made some big shots, which just gives you that gap, you know, not to mention their defense. So, yeah, I agree. I think you make a great point about not letting teams get that momentum. Like, you know, when you, you – you've been through this, but when you when – you, especially young players that get in the playoffs, the playoffs are so emotionally charged that you win a game, you feel invincible. So inherently, they're, you're going into a scrap the next day with, you know, and it's like you're they psychologically the scale shifted. You're happy. You're confident. And sometimes that can be so misleading because you got a team on the other side that's on the map that is desperate. And just watch the film for an hour and a half and their coaches ripped them and the media is telling them they suck. And so psychologically, there's a shift every time a game is played in the playoffs. And it's about managing that shift. It's never too high, never too low is the way a lot of people message it. But that's what it's about is how can you, even if you're up one nothing, 2 nothing, 3-1, feel like you're the underdog. Like you are more desperate than the other team. That is the challenge in the playoffs because it is a, it, you, it's a, an emotionally charged event. It's a roller coaster and you want to limit the ups and downs of that roller coaster and just create that same motivation, that same greedy, greedy mentality to win. And I think some of my son's teams, uh, our son's teams, you know, you get stuck, you, you drop a game and you get stuck and a series goes to six games instead of five, seven games instead of six, and then the Spurs are waiting for you. Like, you, you're doing yourself no favors. Um, so I think there is a battle of attrition as well uh, in the playoffs, and it's important. You know, you got to knock people out as quickly as and, uh, before any weird shit becomes uh, possible. Uh, the, other, the other psychological sort of difficulty in a playoff series is is point differential and stan used to always talk about this because you see this happen where a team gets blown out they lose by 20 or 30 in, in let's say a game two or a game three and and the mood changes the confidence changes and so stan would always tell us like whether you win on a buzzer beater or you win by 30 you just get one in the win-loss column you know, and then and then you go and you make your adjustments the next game. There's no carryover to the next game if you lost by yeah. thirty. This and Denver, so, but but for that's well, that's what's amazing about the, I was going to say about the Denver team is is they look dead in the water. I mean, the, the Clippers I feel like had them figured out, or maybe Denver was tired. I don't know what it was, but early on in that series, I'm like, this is a wrap. It's over. Sure. Sure, and, and I think the same in the Utah series. Like they were like a minus forty five against Utah and won the series. I mean, you, you know, like we're talking about like there's a million ways to skin a cat here and, and it's about winning that game and finding a way. And, you know, when you don't close a team, weird shit can happen and they get this some matchup happens, an injury, uh, someone loses their rhythm. Like there's so many things that can happen. You know, as you see, the Clippers team just completely lost their rhythm and connectivity. Uh, you know, as you said, did you believe did you think that would happen four or five days ago? Even before game seven, game seven, I think 90% of people thought this is Denver team's a nice story, but of course, Kawhi, you know, Clipper, they're going to get this done. And they got beat by 20. I mean, it's so it's – that's the playoffs. And, and the more you play, the more experience you have, the more you realize, like, we can't mess around here. Like, you know, you mess around in the playoffs, you are asking for it. You, met, you mentioned the toughness and connectivity and the, the team that sort of comes to mind right now – that is sort of is Miami like these guys they just won't even when they're down four with a minute and 10 seconds to go yesterday you always feel like they're going to figure out how to come back and do it are you guys we've taught we've had a million guys from that team on this show we have a correspondent Duncan Robinson on this show who plays for that team but are you guys surprised that at at how they've been, because th that's a bunch of new pieces. I mean, Jimmy's the, Jimmy's his first year there. How they've been able to sort of figure out that connectivity so quickly? I sh we shouldn't be surprised. You know what, Spo, his track record speaks for itself. The culture, Pat Riley. I mean, this has been years and years. But like, let's let's be honest. Take a step back. Like, let's think about you know before Christmas or last summer. Like Miami's this close to winning a championship right now. Like that, I don't think anyone 
was predicting that. So it is a testament to them, you know, their player development, uh, you know, the way they've built their roster, the way they took someone like Jimmy, who, you know, Jimmy has this like weird reputation that not everyone's on board, but he's clearly an incredible fighter, teammate, winner. Um, you know, they were sort of like, no, that's our guy, you know, and they built with him. And that, like, that's what, that's a sign of a great culture is when you can identify exactly who fits you instead of like, you know, I, I think, I think he's a fit, right? Like though they, they know clearly he's a fit. He's not, this is what we do. This is our system of behaviors. And, and, and that is why they've just kind of like accelerated so quickly. I mean, I think they also won, they won COVID, you know, like they, they seem the most prepared mentally, emotionally, and physically coming into this in many respects, they took the biggest leap on a, whatever it was, three, four month hiatus, which is incredible. And that speaks to their culture as well. Um, you know, like that, I mean, look, they could lose four, one to Boston. Boston's a terrific team, but they are this close, like to winning a championship and it's incredible. And, and so, you know, here, here's the way I looked at it. I looked at the start of the year. I thought probably the Clippers are the favorite, you know, I have a, this, a deep roster, a lot of versatility, you know, they have a lot going for them, six man, two potential six man candidates. You know, there's so much outside of Kawhi and PG. But I always said all year long, there is something about this Lakers team spirit, you know, that is so, I think those are the intangibles that mean so much, that connectivity. And if you have strong connectivity, all of a sudden you're tougher than you appear to be on paper, you know. And so that that glue, that feeling that they have, you know, is, is, is more so than the talent, what's making the Lakers great, what's making, you know, obviously Miami great, but he, you know, those are also characteristics of Denver and Boston, you know? So you get to the final four and some of these intangibles are so important and we're seeing it on display right now. David Griffin, our, our team president, before we got down to Orlando said the teams that are going to be most successful in the bubble are going to be t- the teams that actually want to be there. And I think there's no question that the four teams that are left want to be there. And you could probably question some other teams, even teams that made the playoffs. You can certainly question some teams that, that were just in the seeding games about whether or not they wanted to be there. Um, I, I've, I've, I've thought about Bam's block like 50 times today. I, the, the sheer physics of it actually don't make sense to me. When you look at the angle of his wrist, where the ball was positioned over the rim... And the force with which Jason Tatum tried to dunk that basketball, it actually just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me that that ball did not go in. It's not, it's not normal. <laughs> it's not normal. <laughs> it's not normal. It's not human. Um, you know, I think like if I got into the physics of it, I think like it just looks like his wrist is there. But really his mass, like his center mass, jumping strength, power is informing much force that wrist so he's an incredible athlete strong and his body moving i think represents a lot of the force that we don't notice so it looks impossible but he's such an athletic strong physical determined player that i I, that's the only way i can see how it's possible that he didn't break his wrist one or get flushed on i mean so the other thing that makes it almost more believable for me is um, I, i feel like amari had a block like that at san antonio in the playoffs where it was like he he literally blocked a dunk with his without touching the rim, you know, with his hand almost in the rim. Like I would snap every bone in my arm if I tried to do that. You know, like I, I don't like it's not just the wrist, fingers, wrist, forearm. You know, so I, I I it's an incredible incredible play, and it's 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 cool to see a game one on a defensive play like that. You know, instead of a you know a twenty five footer or a fadeaway or whatever. Uh, we recently had uh, Mark Cuban on, and we asked him a question, and without hesitation, even before we finished the question, uh, he said Steve Nash, and you know we ba- you know the question of course was you know what was your sort of regret as an owner from from you know a basketball decision standpoint. Um, I know you're you're super tight with Dirk. Do you guys ever ever do the what if game if you had stuck around? We don't. Really? No, we don't. Um, I, some, I don't know. I think both of us are like, it's, let's not even go there. You know, it's like, um, we spent, our families must have spent 
three weeks together this summer at least, maybe four. And uh, it's just it never even came up. Never even – we don't even go near it. I, you know, I think we've both moved on. He got his championship, which is well-deserved and, and awesome. Um, you know, it's, it's, it really is in the past, and I think we're comfortable with where it is. I want, I want to tell a story, and I've, I've told this story uh, probably a, a couple times on this podcast, but because you're on here, um, it's only fitting. So when I was getting ready to turn uh, 30, um, you and I were neighbors. You were, you were building your house in Manhattan Beach, and, and I was uh, renting a couple blocks from your rental, so we'd run into each other. And I asked you basically for some time and some, some counsel and some advice, and uh, – we spent about an hour and a half just grabbing coffee one afternoon. And the two things that you really stuck out were, were just how you trained in your 30s, the difference of how you trained. And I've, I've, I've applied that to my own training. Um, and then the other part of that was I asked you, you were going into your last year with the Lakers. You had dealt with some injuries while you were there. And I asked you, I was like, why are you still playing? And you, you I'll never forget what you said. You said, you know, once you stop playing, you can never get that back. You can have the rest of your life to do whatever you want to do. But once you stop playing, that phase of your life is over for good. And at the time, I thought you were crazy. Uh, you're 10 years older than me. I didn't have that perspective yet. But it's so interesting to me as I, first of all, thank you for the time. But it's so interesting for me to me as I get older and, I, and I'm getting towards the end. I'm like, no, I just want to, I just want to continue this as long as possible. You know, it's like every, every year that goes by, I'm like, no, I, I'll, I'll play till 37. No, I'll play till 38. I'll play. Like, I just, I want to keep going. And I, it's, it's just remarkable how that, how that statement, you know, has impacted me. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad I could help, but I, I mean, it, it is like, you know, you've probably done this. You fall in and out of love with the game and yeah. You, you know, you go through periods. I remember a period when it was tough for me in my mid twenties. I was like, "I'm only going to play a few more years, and I'm done." And like then, when I'm 38, 39, 40, I'm I worked out twice a day for two years. When I was with the Lakers, I literally worked out twice a day for two years to try to overcome my issues. Flying up to Vancouver for physical therapy and. Try absolutely everything. Like, like, never worked harder in my life just to be a part of it still and to play. And I, and of course, you know, you get a bit blind. You know, um, you you still think you can do it. And you're the last to know. You know, in a way. Uh, I remember Nick Young saying to me one day, like he was my teammate the last year with the Lakers before I retired. And, and like, I really thought I could still play. It's just I was having a hard time overcoming this injury and, and more so like recovering between games and stuff. And, and, and Nick was like, man, he's like, what's it like, like to know what you used to do to cats? <laughs> and I was like, this motherfucker just called me so bad. And, and it was like a wake up call. Like I still couldn't admit, but it was a glimpse. It was a glimpse, like, you must look really bad out there <laughs> if, if he's like, this. Is, it's such a difference from who you were. Um, so, like, it, it gives you that little window of yourself. And, and all of these little pictures, you know, they, it ends up being a fabric of the end and figuring it out. But you're right. I, I was so lost in that wanting to just maximize and enjoy every last minute I had with the game because I knew over that fence, you peer out over that fence and you see – like an endless like skyline, right? And basketball's not in it. And what am I going to do? And, you know, I'm a guy with tons of interests and opportunities, but still like the one thing that gave you purpose, identity, uh, a routine, uh, a team, a family, a camaraderie, you know, a challenge, you know, even little, like we're so used to playing in front of, you know, 20,000 people. But like, think it's just like it's a hole to play eighteen years and then not be able to drive downtown every other night and show off in front of eighteen twenty thousand people. Like that's a hole. Like you can't replace that. Um, and so you know, it's it is a like there's an old adage: the athlete dies twice. And you know, when you finish playing, is is your first death. And and honestly, I think to be happy and fulfilled going forward, this is the way I approached it: is you have to be willing to become someone new. 
and you can't tie your identity to basketball. Um, you can't, you can't hold on to that or that's, you know, that's glory days, right? Like that's when you're the same person at 50, 60, you know, relating to that person, you never get away from that person. So you can never find the peace and happiness and the second chapter in full, full spirit, full blood. So it it is tricky time. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I encourage you to, to do everything you can to, to play as long as you can to put yourself in a position one day to be like, okay, I'm good. Like, whether you decide to or your body decides to or the league decides to, you can at least be like, I'm good. I, I gave it everything, you know, like my Lakers situation. I have never worked so hard in my life. I've never wanted something so bad in my life just to play, not to be an all-star or, you know, star or anything, just to play, just to contribute, just to help that team. And, and that, that was, that was the dip. That was the toughest moment of my toughest time of my career for sure. But it was worth it, you know, cause I left being like, I gave it absolutely everything I had. I have sort of a two part question. So I wanted to ask you, cause I, we ask all the retired guys that come on just about that transition. So I wanted to sort of ask you about your own personal journey, those first couple years of being retired, but kind of coinciding with that was just, were you at all like disillusioned or, or, or just bitter, I guess bitter would maybe be a better word about how things ended in LA because when you signed there and you guys brought in Dwight, you know, you're on the cover of sports illustrated, there's an expectation that maybe this is when Steve gets his championship and it just did not go as planned at all. And then you retire and now you're moving into sort of that next stage of your life and I'm wondering if, like, it added to sort of any angst you had about your your career and then the transition. You know, I think it actually did the opposite. Um, it was a it was a helpful end for the next chapter of my life, and I'll tell you why. And it, it's because it it prepared me gradually for this how profound this change is going to be, because I thought. I'm coming to LA. I get to play on this great team, talented roster. I, you know, I, I made the all-star game the year before I went to LA. I was 38 and made the all-star game. So in my mind, I'm like, I, I'm still an all-star. Like I'm going to, you know, and if I'm not, I'm close and I'm going to, you know, we're going to go and we're going to kick ass and we got a chance. And of course I broke my knee, like my first or second game of my career there. I've, my body's never been the same from that breaking that tip fib joint. I have nerve issues every day because of that the the battle to try to play and the oh and and the awakening so to speak that like this might not happen and this is going to be the byproduct that like you're done and that basketball's gone forever and that how emotionally difficult that was for me it really made me wake up one day and be like like th- this is it like for someone that was obsessed you know like shot hundreds of balls every day like did all everything i could possibly do tried to learn about sleep and you know diet and recovery and tra- best practices and training like us you know i tried to get everything out of it i could you know when you're that obsessed and wrapped up into it it's a big big change and that so that tough experience of ending my career in such disappointment it awakened me like when I realized how dark a hole I was in, I was like, this is going to be a, a monster of a process to come out the other side as a healthy, whole, emotionally well person. Right. And, 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 and it was, it was a, it was a, a monster of a process. It, it, it I it, honestly, I, it wasn't as bad because I went through that. And so while I was going through that, I went through the, like, if this is obsession to like holding on so tight to that obsession to realizing like, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind and you're the last to know. And why are you out of your mind? Because you want something so bad and you tie your whole identity to this, your purpose, your structure, your routine. You know, I I, so I had a glimpse like of one realizing that I want this way, way too much and I've lost my mind trying to get this. And then realizing like, over that fence is the horizon of infinity and in basketball is not a part of it. So, it gave me the chance to say like, I need to, I need to let myself go through this. I, I, if I, you know, I didn't have necessarily something that I was like, I want to move right into. And I said, okay, 
try to say no to as many things as possible at first try to sit with this like let this like and i and i and it gave me like that nice space it took me like six months to a year where i'd have days where i'd be like i don't feel right just felt uncomfortable i didn't have that outlet i just it was a transition but i was able because i'd identified that going into the process as part of the process to be aware and say like that's it that's the whole like accept it like let feel it don't deny it right don't keep identifying with that person let it come and so I, it took me six months to two years before it, it all went away but the process ended up being pretty healthy and left me on the other side feeling whole and well and um everything got remarried and have a great family life and you know i feel completely like just solid and all my foundations now which is hard like it's it's that's not a game you know you know the I'm, I'm rambling, sorry, but you know, like there's crazy numbers about divorce, depression, and bankruptcy with retired athletes. And I think the root of those things is the identity and the loss, right? Um, you know, you, you literally, in, in a sense, you died and you have to reinvent or re, you know, you have to be born again in a sense to, to be, to live the rest of your life peacefully. So, you know, maybe I'm getting a little bit in the weeds with it, but that's how big of a, of a that Lakers situation and that two years after my career, how important they were to my well being. Did you did you get counsel from uh, Kobe during this point? Because he's obviously another guy we talk about on the show all the time, but he's another person who was just obsessed to a level that was different from even the rest of your peers who are all obsessed. Everybody in the NBA is obsessed, but he was at he's sort of at a different stratosphere. Yeah, I mean. I didn't, you know, we had conversations about the end, um, in a sense. I, 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 but I don't remember them like that detail to give you a good answer. But I do remember one day he was saying like, you know, like, you know, me and you, we're just going to walk away into the sunset. That's just the way we're built. You know, of course he did his farewell tour after that, but, I, <laughs> but you know, like that, he, I mean, he, I was impressed as much of anything about uh, about Kobe was the way he was handling retirement. Like he obviously won an Academy Award. He he just appeared to be growing into not that he wasn't before an incredible father, you know, an advocate for young players and, and especially the w, WNBA players. Um, so for him to kind of move so fluidly into retirement, at least from a distance was I was incredibly impressed and not something, you know, when you know how competitive he is that you would have des you know, definitely thought, Oh yeah, he's going to transition easy. Um, so I, I, I really admired him for the way he appeared to be transitioning and uh, it's just a great, great tragedy and, and loss. When you came on in 2016, we talked a little bit about just the, the evolution at the point guard position and what it, what it's become today. And you've talked publicly before about sort of, you, you would have shot more probably, you know, you, you probably would have shot more. What would prime Steve Nash average in NBA in the NBA in 2020? How many points? Yeah. I mean, this. Hey, is, if you tell me 17, you're a liar. This is a, fool, that's, <laughs> this is a fool's errand, but uh, you know, of course, I mean, you shoot more, the floor is more spread. There's more opportunity. There's a higher pace. Um, you know, it, it's a different game. So of course I think your scoring averages would go up. It's, it's hard for me to say like, you know, how much, I think the biggest factor in, in the difference between the way I, I, you know, the way I played and the way I should have played theoretically is the way I was brought up, you know, and these yeah, guys today, yeah. they're brought up to attack. Like it's not manage your team, run your club, you know, like it's attack. And so the culture and the game and the analytics and the rules have all influenced this transition. Whereas I grew up like, you know, make your shots, take less of them so you can make your teammates happy, make them better, run the team, be the coach on the floor, you know, have that feel for the game, make the pass that leads to the pass, you know. So that was the, that was the fundamental reason why I didn't shoot more when I played. And then also, like, isn't it kind of embarrassing that all of us uh, – as a basketball community never realized the value of a three point shot <laughs> so recently. I did. I did when I was about 16 years old. <laughs> I, well, I did. Well, I, I, they, I, I, no, I, I'm going to say, well, sorry to interrupt, but I, I will say this. Like I was in high school and college when like Peja was on the Kings 
And he was really, and I know Drazen Petrovic used to do this too, but I, again, I was seven years old when he played. Peja used to pull up for threes on a fast break. It'd be three on one. You know, he was he was the first guy I really saw that was running to the three Good point, point. line, yeah. and so that influenced me so much sure. that I was like, oh. And then when I, by the time I got to Duke, you know, Coach K showed me clips of Peja. He's like, this is how I want you to run in transition: run to the line, shoot the three. I'm like, all right, that's a layup for me. That's my layup. So I I I got it pretty early. All right, let's get to the let's get to the draft. Uh, we're gonna draft, and this is a draft I've been wanting to do for a while. We're gonna draft Will Ferrell movies. A couple comments on this draft. First of all, I've realized in reviewing all of his films, it's a very top heavy draft. There's really only four uh, blue chips in my opinion. And so when I think when this draft is reviewed, you know, eight or ten years from now, that the winner is gonna be the person that finds value late in the draft. Tommy, explain the format. So, Steve, uh, we're snaking it as the guest. You pick first. You go, you're one, I'm two, JJ's three, four, back and forth. Uh, and that's it. So you're up. I mean, I, uh, I'll preface it by saying I looked over his films last night. There's two things going on here. There's a Will Ferrell movie, and then there's movies that Will Ferrell's in, you know, which some are great as well. So, but, um, and the other thing is, like, I haven't seen any of these movies for years which is weird now to try to draft which one. So I'm kind of going off what my feeling is about them. So I'm going to start with Zoolander as my number one pick. As the number one pick. The number Good one pick. <laughs> wow. Good pick. Yep. I mean, that, that's a top. That to yeah. me is a, <laughs> is a unique piece of cinema. <laughs> unique. Tom, Tommy, uh, you can't draft Lion King. Uh, Steve. I picked. Oh, Will I Ferrell picked, is not in Lion King, by the shots, way. Shots. Shots. We did a we did a uh, best movie villains draft a couple weeks ago with D Wade and I picked Mugatu in my top five and people did not <laughs> <laughs> did not like that pick. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I would not even cross my mind as a movie villain. I love that. It's great. I'm going one. I'm going. I just am taking it right now because I know JJ. I want to take it from JJ. I'm going. Uh, I'm going Step Brothers. You're you're a complete <laughs> asshole for that. <laughs> It's a great, great. That's, I'm not even sure it's the best one. It is. It's it off the best. JJ's board. <laughs> it's the best movie that he's ever made. Just to be clear. Oh well, it's my pick. So um, you right, I can find. Yeah, it's all good. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go. Anchorman, the Legend of Ron Burgundy, the first Anchorman, uh, and then I'm I'm torn between Elf and Old School, but everybody needs a good holiday classic, so I'm gonna go Elf. That's. Uh, I like Elf as well. Um, Elf to me is overrated, so I'm happy you picked that. Okay, well you're oh. you're gonna you're gonna pick a movie that shouldn't be rated. I know which movie you're gonna pick at some point. It's, it's now I'm it's the worst I'm movie. Picking, okay, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I'm picking I'm taking old school right now. Old school would have been probably my first pick. I think old school is one of the best comedies ever, but I I wasn't sure it was gonna get taken. So old school is number two. All right, so I get two. You got two and three. Okay. Yeah, you get two and three. I mean, for me, that we 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 we, we drop down a level now. Yes. Yes, oh, totally. Wait, we have Zoolander, Old School Anchorman, Step Brothers, Elf off the board. This is tough. I mean, because like he was in Austin Powers 1, but it's not his movie. It counts. Everything, anything he's in counts. I mean, I think that was a, that was a great movie. Like at the, at the time, I'm going Austin Powers. International Man of Mystery. I love it. It's a good book because it's a really good movie and his, his specific character is fantastic in it. I think it's a great pick. It's a great pick. Yep. Steve, you got one more. Um, this is weird. I mean, Talladega Nights was great. Wedding Crashers is great. I have a soft spot for like semi-pro kicking and screaming Night at the Roxbury. You're just Steve. You're naming all the movies. You got to pick one. You got to pick one. <laughs> you got to pick one. <laughs> and stop giving Tommy you're ideas. Stop everything. it. I hate you guys. Okay, stop <laughs> doing this. Thing. Just naming his IMDb. <laughs> I mean, I wrote a little list here. Okay, I'm going to say uh, the one that gives me the, the, the best feeling is probably Wedding Crashers. I know you had a small role, but. Uh, I wanted that. I thought I was going to, I thought it was going to sleek, slip through. <sighs> Steve's list is looking good right Steve's now. Steve's list is looking great. I, I just want to say one thing, though. Wedding Crashers, and there's been articles on this, it's, I don't think it holds up in 2020. There's a lot of problematic, uh, just, themes in that movie <laughs> you know what that's, that's a good point and that goes back to my original point is that i i can barely remember 
No, I know. I'm not. I'm not knocking you. <laughs> it's still funny though. If, if a, you see it's Wedding it's Crashers, hilarious. it's hilarious. On TBS at like two in the morning, you're probably gonna watch the end of it. All right. All right. I'm th- my third pick. Uh, as Steve mentioned, I think it's a criminally underrated film. I've seen it about fifty times. Night at the Roxbury. I knew you were gonna pick that. Criminally and, underrated. And this is and this is the this is the movie. When people talk about who won this draft, this is where you lost the draft. Just to be clear, that see, this no is one else dis- was going to pick this. I disagree with this. And you took it in the third round. I disagree with this because there is a there is a night at the Roxbury hive of people on the internet that love it and actually maybe would have picked it first or second. Oh jeez! All right, all right. Uh, I'm I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with the other guys. That's good. Uh, solid. solid film with uh, Wahlberg, and and I'm actually going to go with Blades of Glory. Oh, not bad. I didn't even have that on my list. So. Yeah, I only saw that once. That was, yeah. that was All right, who's up? All right, fourth. I got a weird one. I'm not even sure if you guys have seen you this another movie. weird one. Yeah. <laughs> so he was in a he was in a movie in 1998 called Dick. Oh yeah, about um about Richard Nixon. Yeah. And Bob he Wood- plays Bob and, Woodward, and he he plays Bob Woodward. The movie is very the movie is uh, certainly underrated. I don't know if it was like a big hit or anything like that, but him as Bob Woodward is hilarious and is especially funny now because of all the Bob Woodward news. And all I can do is think about Will Ferrell playing Bob Woodward. So Dick is number four. All right, didn't have that on my list. I'm gonna say Talladega Nights and Semi Pro. Okay, solid list. All right, well done. Well done, Steve. Appreciate it's that. It's a solid list. You're you're definitely beating Tommy right now. I was nervous. All right. This is tough. This is tough now cuz I need a I need a fifth one. Well, you Ooh. need you also need a third and a fourth one. I th- oh, I got it. I feel like I got everything it. Everything must go is right up Tommy's ass. I got my fifth one. <laughs> I got my fifth one, which I don't think is going to be on your guys you guys have even thought about. Stranger than fiction. Lego movie. Oh man. I'm out. Was- I'm out, guys. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> out. Boom. I'm out. Oh, wow. There's, Talk okay. about value in the fifth round. Man, I, wow. I, I, have, I have small kids, and I'm still out. All right. <laughs> no, I'm going to – there's really not a lot of good movies <laughs> left not here. A lot left. Um, but I would say – you guys maybe not, haven't even seen this. I actually watched it when it came out during the first phase of, uh, of lockdown. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with uh, Eurovision Song Contest – the story of Fire Saga. I heard, that, I heard that's horrific. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. You're literally the only person I've ever met who's no, watched that. No, every list that I consulted in my research on this had it as a top 10 to 12 film. Yeah, but of see, his. You, you can't have your list on the consensus of the Zeitgeist. It has to be your list. I'm trying to win, Steve. I'm trying to win. Top 10 to 12 film in 2020. How many movies even come out in 2020? <laughs> all right we'll take your word for it all right uh <laughs> man steve uh thank you so much for the time um i'm sure we'll we'll see you around in brooklyn man yeah love to see you good to see you boy thanks for having me all right all right thanks see you dude